Hey, we all love a good story, don't we? Don't you love a story of uh, finding out how you met or a love story, how two people met? Don't you love the comeback story of, man, this person was down and out and then somehow they were rescued? If you're anything like me, one of my favorite questions I ask people is, hey, what's your story? Because I want to know you. I want to know your background. I want to know what maybe Jesus has done in your life. And so uh, I want to start off today with sharing you my story. It's going to be a little bit different. You got to hang on tight because I don't know if you've ever heard it this way before. You ready? Y'all are. Here we go. (laughs) I don't understand this world sometimes. So I just close my eyes and start to spit my rhymes. Sharpen the pencil, fill in the lines. Take it slow because this junk's going to take some time. These words are who I am. My heart, they're all mine. So look me in the eyes. This junk's the junk of the real kind. I was just a young boy growing up in the West. Before the age of 10, I was faced with a test. The blunt was lit. It could have been a mess, but somebody was there when I was in distress. Waking up in the middle of the night, hearing my mom's screams. It scared me to death. It tore me at my seams. Every day, just a reoccurrence of my life's themes. It was like I was Michael Jordan. I was getting double teamed. Holes in the wall, shattered glass all around. With my own eyes, I saw my sister on the ground. I wanted to break free from this life that I'd found. I wanted to get it like when you distinguish the verb from the noun. When I was 11 years old, I packed my bags and I moved away. I looked my mom in her eyes, but I didn't know what to say. I knew I needed something different. It was time to break away from the life I was living. I knew I'd be okay. I started going to church. I heard about God. I prayed a prayer, became a member of his squad. I became the fisher. He became my rod. Christmas had new meaning. Feliz Navidad. When I was 15 years old, things got out of proportion. An older friend of mine got pregnant but decided to get an abortion. My heart ripped inside. All my organs disproportioned. It was like Satan serving dinner and he gave me the double portion. My mom went missing, didn't know where she was, probably cruising around town, feeling good with her buzz, selling all she had to buy her some crack. I would call and I would call, but she wouldn't call back. I was about to give up, let her life be whack. How could we be so different as white as from black? But I was on my knees when I heard Jesus speak. He told me to have faith and don't be weak. And if I trust in him, he'll put me on a winning streak. But it was 2 a.m. when things got outrageous. The shaky voice of my sister started to become contagious. I started to freak out, but I knew I had to be courageous. How I handled the situation proved to be advantageous. See, my stepmom was half dead, just lying in her bed, giving up on her life. When my dad lifted her head, her eyes puffy and red, and tried to save his wife. I wasn't being safe driving down the interstate, thinking about my stepmom. What was her fate? When I got to the hospital, would it be too late or would she be dead staring at heaven's gate? 32 sleeping pills wasn't enough to kill God's plan. He rescued my stepmom just like he healed a blind man. Satan didn't win, but he tucked his tail and ran sooner to God's voice, the voice of the man. My real mom, she went to rehab, wanted to change from old to new, wanted to be clean without using that cheap suave shampoo, clean on the inside, a life of no drugs she wanted to pursue. She came to visit, we sat in a pew, and she accepted Jesus. It was her Christian debut. See, God gave me the desires that lay within my heart. The way he rescued my mom was truly a work of art. Her, his love for her flew off the chart. Remember overdose woman, my stepmom? She ended up having an internet affair. And when she left my dad, the pain I couldn't bear. How could you leave me? How the heck is this fair? You might as well let me fry in an electric chair, honestly. I don't care. She disowned me as a son, said that she was done. She killed me with her words. It might as well have been a gun. But you know, God is bigger than that. Let me tell you why. He is there beside me every time I cry. Even if I was in the electric chair, he wouldn't let me fry. He will fight for your soul like them cats in Shanghai. This dude is nothing but the truth. I'm not even a lie. So why do bad things happen to good people? Man, shut up, I hate that phrase. If Adam hadn't sinned back in the beginning days, all would be perfect. Our hearts would blaze, our hands would raise all of our days. We force this junk on ourselves, people. God didn't want it this way. So God isn't laughing at us. He doesn't point when we're at our low, but he wants to pick us up, set us on a plateau. He wants to put his arms around us. He never wants to let go, but we always pull away and say, no thanks, bro. Do you see the big picture of the love that he wants us to know that he let his only son die so we learn how to grow? If I painted you the picture, it should be as good as Van Gogh. To be awake is to be alive, perfectly said by my boy, David Thoreau. Are you alive in Jesus? If not, you're dead. Why don't you leave your life behind and follow Jesus instead? This is my story. You have one too. Just wanted to tell you, the rest is up to you. The power of story. It always seems a little weird when people clap out of a story of, of my life and coming out of just emptiness and darkness, and, but then celebrating the redemptive grace of Jesus. Uh, for me in my life, I don't know if it's different than your life, but, but I had to make a choice at 13. Is, is Jesus really my everything? Am I really going to make this choice and trust Jesus in everything in my life? I, I had to trust Jesus to be my father. I had to trust Jesus to be my mother. I had to trust Jesus that that he would take the plans of my sisters and protect them. 
I had to trust that Jesus would never leave me or forsake me. I had to trust Jesus with everything in my life. And we're in the middle of a series, at the very end of a series called Jesus Over Everything. And for many of us, it's an idea, it's a, it's a grasp at straws, it's, it's a title on a screen, Jesus over everything. And we can nod our heads and we can feel good about it. But the reality of the situation is, if you and I do not believe that Jesus is over everything in our life, then he's over nothing. You and I have to believe, we have to take that faith step of going, man, Jesus, you are over 2020. Hey, Jesus, you are over all of my fear. Hey, Jesus, you are over all of the religion and rules. Jesus, you're over all generation, young and old. Jesus, you are over the election. Jesus, you are over the results. And if we believe these things, our lives will be drastically different. If we really, church, if we really understood and if we really believe that Jesus is over everything in our life, then the mission that's set in front of us is pretty massive. The belief and the idea that Jesus over everything doesn't just allow us to stay in our seats and clap at a good spoken word or raise our hands in a good worship song. The belief of going, man, if Jesus is, is really over everything in my life, it causes us to move, to take a step, to jump into the unknown. And today I'm talking about and closing out our series, Jesus over our city. Just a quick question. Do you believe Jesus is over our city? Does it feel like Jesus is winning in Milton? Does it feel like Jesus is winning in Alpharetta? Does it feel like he's winning in Canton or Roswell or Johns Creek? Hey, if you're watching online, put in the city you're from in the chat. Does it feel like he's winning there? Because if you and I look at our world as we drive by and maybe get outside of our Christian bubble, it comes to our realization really quick that, man, people aren't for Jesus. And if people aren't for Jesus, how can Jesus be over them? And so our mission today, our ask today is massive. Question one, do you believe that Jesus is over everything? Message to her question two, are you willing and able to be the instrument Jesus has used to change our city so Jesus can be over Milton? Jesus, he can be over Canton. Jesus, he can be over Sandy Springs and Cumming and Johns Creek. And Jesus can be over every city that we go. But it starts with us. And it starts with our belief of going, Jesus, you're over everything. Hey, before we jump into Mark 6 today, let me pray for us as we get ready. Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for this place. Thank you so much for these people. I, I pray, Jesus, that we take this message, we, we, we take this belief that you're over everything and we take it to the world. I pray, Jesus, you'll be with us this morning. You'll interpret the words out of my mouth into the hearts of everyone in this room. I love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 6 today if you have your Bibles or your phone. And we're going to kind of jump around scripture a little bit. But we see that Jesus, as he grew up, he didn't really start his, his ministry until he was 30 years old. So up until 30 years old, Jesus is preparing for his ministry that he would have for three years to, to share to the world his story and the story of the kingdom of God. One of the first things Jesus does after he's baptized and he enters into his ministry, one of the first things he does is he goes back home. He goes to his hometown. He goes back to his city. And in scripture in Mark chapter 6, it says that Jesus began to preach in the synagogues, at the temple, at the church. Could you imagine going back to your hometown and preaching? Like, you get it. You go back to your hometown. People knew what you were like as a third grader, as a high school student. People knew the trouble you got into. Your ex-girlfriends and your ex-boyfriends, like all the drama is in that hometown. And Jesus walks into his hometown and begins to preach to the synagogues. And they reject him. And we don't know exactly why they rejected him, but maybe they thought, oh, you're just the carpenter guy. You're just a dude that's just kind of a has-been. You're the guy that was always perfect, always doing the right things. Oh, you're just, I remember you, Jesus, and get out of here. And Jesus does something kind of ridiculous sometimes, I think. I, sometimes I want like warrior Jesus of like, no, this is my city. This is my hometown. I'm going to start here and I'm going to finish here. But the scripture says that Jesus actually backed away and left his city. But he didn't give up. The scripture says that he left his city and went to other cities. He says he went among other villages teaching. 
when we think of the word missionary or we think of the word story and we think of a pastor or somebody, spiritual leader in your life asking you to go make Jesus famous through story, one of the, the first places we go is to the, our, our inner circle. And maybe it's your friend, maybe it's your family, maybe it's someone you trust. And, and, and if we can get real for a second, sometimes that inner circle is the first people that reject us. That the people that we thought we could trust, the people that we could thought we could be vulnerable with in our own story, that they actually turn against us. And many times in our lives, because of the transformation we've had with Jesus, we share our stories with the people that we feel like are for us and love us, and they reject us and turn away from us. Students, this happens in your life all the time. That, that you turn your life over to Jesus, you go back to school, and those friends that, that you're so pumped and you tell them about Jesus, no, I don't want, I don't want to be a part of you anymore. And you're like, man, this is the greatest thing in my life. And they walk away. And, and, and sometimes in our minds, we go, man, do we just need to give up on this whole Jesus thing? Not, not the personal relationship of Jesus, but the sharing of Jesus, because re- rejection is, is extremely tough. And Jesus felt the rejection. Jesus was in the midst of rejection in his hometown. And he turns and he walks away, but he didn't give up. He left his home, but went to another home. He left his neighborhood, but went to another neighborhood. He left his city and he went to another city. And then, he, then he knew, as, as he's spreading his own gospel and his own story, that he, he knew that he needed a team of people to help him along his mission. And he knew that, that you cannot change the city by yourself. Although Jesus is all powerful, although Jesus is the Messiah of the world, and although Jesus probably could have done the whole mission by himself, he, he enlisted 12 men to come, to come close to him, and he gathered and he picked, and I want you on my team, and you on my team, and you on my team, and he gathered these 12 men and began to like preach the story of Jesus to them. And then we see in, in Mark chapter 6, remember Jesus leaves his hometown, he goes to other cities, and he does something remarkable in Mark chapter 6, verse 7, through 12. Jesus, it says this, it says, he called, Jesus called the 12, the 12 disciples and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on, and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And this is really important. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they proclaimed that people should repent. Oftentimes, we believe our mission is to save people. Jesus didn't say, hey, hey, my 12 dudes, I want you to go city by city and you do all the work. The mission for these 12 guys is to share the story. I mean, we realize where we are in the scripture, right? Jesus has just entered on the scene. Maybe he's in six months, a year, 18 months max. All these disciples know about Jesus in some Old Testament scripture that kind of pointed to him. And then Jesus himself. These men, they go out two by two, not alone. And they walk into different cities. And Jesus says, hey, look, you walk into a house. And it's pretty comical. Hey, stay there until you leave. Like, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> How can I leave before I get there? Stay in the house until you leave it. And if peace is there, you stay. If peace isn't there, leave. Take off your shoe and wave it in their face and walk away. I think many times when we think of being a missionary or sharing the love of Jesus, we feel like we've got to sit and convince and argue with somebody to convince that they know Jesus. When I was 13 years old, I gave my life over to Jesus. I was pumped. I was excited. I had just come from Jamaica on a mission trip and I was sitting in my living room playing video games with a good friend of mine. And we began to talk about the mission trip and I got to talk about Jesus. And next thing you know, I'm yelling, screaming, crying at this guy because I want to convince him to turn his life over to Jesus. And my dad had to kind of pull me out of the living room and goes, no, 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 no Ryan, that, that's, that's not the mission. The mission isn't for you to convince. The mission isn't for you to shame. The mission isn't for you to make people feel bad because they don't fully understand the love of Jesus. The mission is just to be sent and tell your story. Hey, if there's peace there, you stay. Continue the conversation. If there's not peace, it's okay. Your mission with them is over for now. And we've got to believe that Jesus will come through later. There are some things that it's not good and can't work well alone. 
Have you ever tried to play Frisbee alone? <laughs> uh, kind of side story, Elevate City, our campus in Sandy Springs, Caden Dolmage, he, he's a, a, a protege there. Uh, they go to the park in Sandy Springs several weeks ago and he sees this man playing Frisbee in the park alone. Literally, guy grabs the Frisbee, throws it, grabs the Frisbee, <laughs> throws it. Caden decided, man, this is probably not a thing you should do alone. Like Frisbee doesn't look fun alone. And so Caden grabs his Frisbee and begins to throw Frisbee with this man. And they begin to throw this Frisbee back and forth. And as they throw the Frisbee, they begin to kind of share their story and what God is doing and, and what God's doing through this church in Sandy Springs. Oh, that Sunday, this man shows up to the campus at Sandy Springs. That Sunday, this man raises his hand and goes, I, I want to follow Jesus. And I think he's taking next steps into baptism. Side story, some things aren't done well alone. But we've been taught this as a young kid. If you see somebody in the cafeteria sitting by themselves, what do you do? Go sit with them. If you see someone alone, go, go invite them. But, but the reality of the situation when it comes to the mission of Jesus, so often we try to do this mission alone. We try to, try to play Frisbee alone. And it's as crazy as trying to give a hug alone or talk on the phone alone or celebrate a birthday alone or grieve alone. Some things just aren't meant to be done alone. Making Jesus famous is not to be done alone. Making Jesus famous is not meant to be done alone. He understands the stress. He understands the intimidation. He, he understands the pressure. He understands how much boldness it takes to creep out in there and ask a question or grab a Frisbee. He understands the pressure. It's interesting in Mark chapter six, just after he sends out the 12 disciples two by two, he, he interacts with a guy who is demon possessed. You may have heard the story before, but this demon-possessed man is bloody and naked. He falls on his knees before Jesus and says, please save me. Jesus takes these demons. He throws them to some pigs on a nearby hillside. These 2,000 pigs jump into the lake and this man is freed from his, his, his demon possession. He, he then looks at Jesus and goes, I, I want to come with you. I, I want to be the 13th disciple. And Jesus, in the end of, of Mark chapter 5, sorry, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus says this. Jesus goes, hey, go to Decapolis, the 10 cities. Go, go to the 10 cities. And this is what I want you to do, demon-possessed man who's not demon-possessed anymore. I want you to go tell about the glory about the, of what I've done in your life. We hear nothing else about this man. That's Mark chapter five. And then Jesus sends out the 12 disciples two by two to surrounding cities. And in the middle of Mark chapter six, 17 verses after he sends out the 12 disciples, Jesus shows up in, Deca in Decapolis and feeds 5,000 men. Scripture says 5,000 men. If every man brought a woman, every woman brought a child, 15,000 people gather around and get to experience Jesus do one of the most incredible miracles numerically throughout, throughout all of scripture. Coincidence? Just something cool he did? Maybe Decapolis, not, not just one city, but maybe, maybe 10 cities be, began to get transformed because these men, two by two, were going ahead of Jesus. This demon-possessed man who was restored began to go ahead of Jesus. And then a year later... Jesus sends out the 72. In Luke chapter 10, verse 1, it says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. A year later, Jesus sends out the 12. 12 months later, he only has 72. That's crazy. These men get to see Jesus heal a blind guy. People around get to hear the stories of, of Jesus raising someone from the grave. This Jesus is walking around town and incredible acts of miracles are happening all around him. And it takes 12 months for 72 other people to rise up in the ranks. And Jesus said it. He said, hey, the harvest is plentiful, 
But the laborers, man, they're few. Jesus works his tail off for 12 more months and 72 people join the mission. But something incredible in this verse that stuck out to me this week. He sent them out ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he, Jesus himself, was about to go. Jesus had these 36 couples. He sent them on 36 different mission trips to 36 different cities. And he goes, hey, you two, I want you to go up Highway 9 just a little bit. And I want you to just to go door to door and talk about Jesus. I'll be there in a second. Hey, hey, you guys, can you go south to Roswell? And can you just go hang out there? Hey, I'm coming after you. I'll be there in a little bit. Hey, you guys, can y'all go south down Highway 9 and just kind of jump into some neighborhoods or go into some stores and start talking about Jesus? I'll be right there behind you. So often in our lives, we believe that, that the mission is just for us to carry the story to Jesus and we're left alone. That we not only have to share our story, but we have to close the deal. Did you feel the pressure of this in the, your early mission trips as a teenager? When you came back from the mission trip and go, 3,274 people committed their lives to Jesus. And everybody gives you a standing applaud and you're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. We don't know. We don't really know who closes the deal or who actually gives their life to Jesus. And so often it's put all the pressure on us. And Jesus goes, no, 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 I don't want the pressure on you. No, all I want you to do is find a friend and share your story. And I'm going to close the deal. I'm coming behind you. Hey, you know your mom you've been working on? I'm about to close the deal on your mom. Hey, you know your friend at work that you've just been, been loving and inviting to church? I'm about to show up and close the deal. Hey, you know your kids that you've just been praying for and you're just hoping and believing that Jesus is going to do something? Jesus is coming and Jesus is going to close the deal. Jesus sent the 72 and he goes, I'm coming right behind you. But so often in our lives, we feel like we're all alone. And then we give up and we take off our own shoes and we take off our own sandals and we just storm away and we don't shake the dust of our sandals at anybody anymore. We just shake our sandal at Jesus going, this, is, this isn't worth it. Jesus has sent you and Jesus is coming after you. He's not coming after you. He's not chasing you down, but Jesus is coming after you. Jesus sent you into your office. Jesus sent you into your neighborhood. Jesus has sent you to the park on Saturday mornings with your kids. Jesus has sent you with the other moms as you raise your kids. Jesus has sent you there and he's coming after you. But, but when it comes to close the deal, when Jesus comes to close the deal, will they even know who he is? When Jesus shows up in your house, is your son and daughter going to look at him and go, I, I mean, my parents went to church. When Jesus shows up at your office, because my, my boy, he, he's had to prepare the way for me and they're going, Who? I mean, there's that one dude who prays every now and then at lunch. Jesus is going to go before you. But when he gets there, are people even going to know about him? For the next three years, Jesus continues to go from city to city. That, that was his mission. That was his declaration. And, and he begins to kind of finalize the story of him as Messiah and King when, when they, they beat him and they, they, they lay him up on a cross. And Jesus dies for you and I. Jesus' blood covers every one of our sins so we could have this opportunity to have grace and, and relationship with God the Father. They, they grab Jesus from the cross. They, they, they throw him into a tomb. Three days later, he, he raises from the grave. And for 40 days, he hangs out with the disciples. Kind of this after party. Kind of this plus 40 days deal. And, and Jesus is beginning to walk with his disciples. And on the very last day, he has this one last conversation with his disciples and he proclaims as he's ascending into heaven, city, 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 don't stop going to cities. Well, some of his last words, some of the last things, some of the, the last declarations that he said in, in Acts 1 verse 68, it says, so when they come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you finished yet? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Jesus so desperately wanted people to be for him. Jesus so desperately wanted cities to be for him. This word witness. Jesus said he wants you to be a witness in Jerusalem. Your hometown. Your family. The people that grew up around you. The people that know you the most. I want you to be a witness there first. He goes, I want you to be a witness to Judea and Samaria. The the next cities. Maybe you moved on from your hometown, but the next cities and the people who look look differently than you and believe differently than you. And then he says, to the ends of the earth, people who live on a different continent than you. So, So often we believe we've been a witness, but I think what Jesus really wants for us is to be an eyewitness. We've had stories back in high school or even around the office where people talk and you're like, yeah, 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 I remember, I remember. You weren't there, but you were a witness because somebody else had told you something. But something that really stands up in court is when you're an eyewitness, when you were there, when you saw it. And Jesus is going, hey, I want you to be an eyewitness. I want you to be a part of this life transformation in other people. I want you so desperately to walk into your work and walk into your home and walk the streets of your neighborhood so bad so you can become an eyewitness of people turning their lives over to me. And if that happens, church, our city begins to get transformed. People begin to stop living for themselves. People begin to stop living for for other outward uh, reasons and they start living out of the humility of Jesus. Are you an eyewitness? Coming up on this holiday season, we have Thanksgiving and Christmas. And as we end the year of 2020, I want to give you some three tangible ways to be an eyewitness as we close out 2020. One, in in your hometown. There has to be someone, right? A family member, an uncle, an aunt, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father. Maybe you should just write write, write a letter to them this year sharing your story, sharing what Jesus has done in and through you, your marriage. Maybe next time you talk to your aunt or your uncle or your brother or your sister, you just say, hey, 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 before we get off the phone, can I, just, can I just pray over you and your family? Small step, but huge step. Maybe you need to t- tell your mom or your dad your story for the first time. You, your, your hometown, your people. How, how are you going to share the love of Jesus to them? Judea, Samaria, how how are you going to tangibly take the mission of Jesus to people who look differently than you and who believe differently than you? Alpharetta is diverse. And maybe you should start playing in your front yard instead of your backyard. Maybe you should actually start walking around your neighborhood so you can meet your neighbors and maybe they're going to think differently than you or look differently than you. Maybe you should have a cul-de-sac cookout. Maybe at work this week you should ask somebody, hey, what's your favorite coffee? coffee? And you just grab a coffee for them to the ends of the earth. How do we take this thing to the ends of the earth? We have Operation Christmas Child that you can still do a box online. We have Compassion Kids that we sponsor. And maybe we go on the Compassion website and get travels tough. And how do you go to the ends of the earth? But Jesus is saying, hey, look, my last request, the mission for you is to, to go to your city, go to your hometown, go to other cities, people who, look, who believe differently than you and who look differently than you and to the ends of the earth the earth. I wonder what the disciples were thinking there. Like, man, this is, this is a big mission. <laughs> this is a massive mission. And Jesus is going, dream big, man. Dream huge. Don't give up on your people. Don't give up on those people. Don't give up on your city. And becoming a missionary can just be frightful. The idea of sharing the gospel, you're like, those are for like the super holy people. Maybe you've met somebody who's been a missionary to Africa or overseas and you're just like, holy cow, like, man, that, that's like the epitome of faith. Like, man, if I can just get there. What I've found about missionaries as I've spoken to them is they're extraordinarily ordinary. They're, they're not way different than you or I, but the difference is, is that they're willing to go. They probably don't have way more scripture memorized than you do. They probably don't have a better story than you do. They don't wear a cape like we all think they do. They just have a story and they're, they're glued into the mission. In Acts, you see a story of, of Saul. And Saul is, is running around. He's killing Christians. He's known for, for, for killing Stephen, kind of the first Christian martyr. They stoned him to death. 
And this historical text I actually say that the Saul would go into villages, go into cities. He would open people's doors and he would ask them, are you a Christian? Are you followers of the way? You believe in this Jesus man? And he began to drag men, women, dads, mothers, kids down back to murder them. And Saul was a brutal dude. He was, he was opposing Christianity. And what was his method? City to city, door to door, person to person. And Saul's actually on a mission to go find more Christians to murder when Jesus meets him on the road to Damascus. And he blinds him and turns his life upside down and Saul becomes Paul and Paul becomes the greatest missionary in the entire world. Isn't it wild to believe that Jesus and God chose Saul? If, if God chose Saul, can't he choose you? Yes, Saul had influence, but he was a mean dude. He was terrible. He was brutal. And in a matter of minutes, Jesus grabbed hold of this man's life and sent him on mission and saw Paul become the greatest missionary of all time. Every single one of us in this room, God is choosing you. It's like, it's like PE in middle school. There's Jesus and the other guy, I guess. And Jesus goes, I don't want you on my team. You can't pick yet. I want you on my team. You can't pick yet. I want you on my team. Can't pick yet. You, 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 you. And he looks at this team and goes, I'm gonna create a dynasty. I'm gonna create a team that is gonna make me so famous. You're gonna oppose me. You're gonna come against me. You're gonna fight and go door to door, city to city, person to person, but so am I, but my team's gonna be greater than yours and my team's gonna win throughout all history. And we have the captain that's, that's chosen us. So we, we come over here. We be a part of this team, this dynasty, become an eyewitness. This is why we do our raise my hand every, every Sunday. Because we want to give you the opportunity to go, hey, you want to be an eyewitness? You want to recruit more people to be part of the biggest dynasty in all of mankind? Come hang out with us. And most Sundays, we're going to give you an opportunity to raise your hand, this bold step of, of committing your life to Jesus. And then we're going to walk alongside of you and not let you be alone. All you need is a friend, a story, and some boldness. I woke up at 5 a.m. on June 11th, 2007. I was nervous. I texted my dad and I texted my mom and I texted my sisters and some of my friends. I might be out of commission for a while. Don't know what this thing is gonna look like. I hop in my car drive an hour from Kennesaw to Alpharetta and I pull up at North Point Mall, 7 a.m. Walk into the door, so security guards right there. And I said, hey, my name is Ryan Rohan. And he let me in as I walk into this empty mall with just a few people walking around. There's two Mercury Mariners in the middle of North Point Mall. Star 94 had put out a, uh, an ask for, hey, do you wanna live in a car to win it? If you live in a car for 31 days and you outlast all the other components, you will leave North Point Mall with a car. But you've got to stay in the car at all times. Every three hours, you get a 10 minute break to use the restroom to grab food or do whatever you needed to do. No cell phones were allowed in the vehicle. No paper, no books, nothing. So put my bag in the back of the car. I sat in the driver's seat. Another contestant, I'm huge compared to these little four foot people. I sit in the car, go, man, am I really gonna do this? You guess I needed a car. But my mission was to make Jesus famous. My mission was to proclaim the name of Jesus. My mission was to tell my story and to be bold. So three or four days, begin to form relationships with people in the cars as people walked by in the mall and paraded around us like we were bears at a zoo. Joey McLaughlin, the lead pastor at 
Elevate City. Would, I threw my keys to him as, as I left and said, here's my car, don't wreck it. Will you come see me? And most days after school, he would get in that car and drive an hour to Alpharetta and encourage me. He would pray over me. He was my champion. He'd go grab me food, anything I needed. After week one, we were like, dude, Joey, how do we make this thing even grander? I said, let me preach out the window of our car on a Friday afternoon. You pass out flyers and we'll see how it goes. So he prints out some flyers and him and some friends come back to North Point Mall, begin to pass out flyers. I stick my head out the window and preach for 45 minutes my story, what Jesus has done in my life, why I was doing this. People began to respond and Joey's like, ah, what do I do? I don't need, what do I do here? And we're like, Jesus will close the deal. I don't know. After several more days, I felt like, man, this isn't the end goal for me. He's probably not to win a car. I think my mission's done here. Live on air, I step out of the vehicle. I, I kind of go on the platform and start interviewing with Steve and Vicki or one of the personalities. And they ask me this question, Ryan, why did you leave? I said, man, I don't need a car. A car would be nice, but I'll work an extra five or 10 hours a week and make a payment for a car. But, but I came here for a mission. I want people to know this new Jesus that I know. I want people to know that there's grace and redemptive power in Jesus. And man, I don't, I don't know if I accomplish that, but I, I feel like my time's done. As I pulled away from the mic, Jessica Weehunt, she ended up winning the vehicle. She goes, Ryan, man, I, I, start, I came in youth group and I was dating an older guy and got judged. And I told myself I would never step foot in a church again. I, I'm gonna give it a second shot. Ebony, I think she came in second. She was like, man, I never understood the full grace of Jesus and how Christianity could, could be so fun. I want to give it a shot. Let me get to pull back and go, man, Jesus, are you really doing something? Are you really closing the deal on this? Because I, I don't know what's happening. There was a woman probably in her 50s standing outside of the vehicle. So she had a bag of stuff. Sometimes people would come and give us different desserts and, and homemade items and as I was getting my bag out of the car, she goes, hey, Ryan. I go, yeah, do I know you? And she goes, no, I just, I came to bring you some food. So that's great, weird, but that's good. And she goes, Ryan, you, you changed my life. And I'm trying to like replay what I've said on air. I'm trying to replay what happened. And I'm like, I, I, how? And the reality is, I don't know. There was nothing special about me, but the, the thing that I did was I, I stepped out in boldness. I didn't do it by myself. I had a friend come along and help me and partner with me through it. I shared my story and Jesus, man, he closed the deal. Church, what's your story? Do you have a friend? Are you willing to be bold and do you trust that Jesus will close the deal? I think if we can get there, then maybe we can declare that Jesus, he'll be over Milton. Jesus, he'll be over Alpharetta. Jesus will be over Canton. Jesus will be over Roswell. Jesus will be over whatever city that you're on and watching from online. But are you willing? to live out some of the last declarations of his last breath before he ascended into heaven. Will you go and we tell the world about me? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity to learn and grow and to know about you. I pray Jesus, we can be bold people. I pray Jesus that we can go for it. I pray Jesus that you will identify a friend in our lives that we can partner up with. I pray, Jesus, you'll give us clarity in our story. I pray, Jesus, that you'll just put people in front of us that just make it so obvious. It doesn't even feel bold. Jesus, I pray for those people right now going, man, I, I want to get picked. I, I, I want to be on the dynasty. I, I, I'm ready to go. Like, I, I want to make a difference. I'm, I'm sick of just living this life by my own and for my own selfish reasons. All that Jesus wants from us and from you is just to declare that, Jesus, you're over everything. So maybe even right where you're at right now, you're, you're going, whoa. I think I'm ready to make that declaration. And in your heart or out loud or in a whisper, 
It's as simple as going, Jesus, will you be over everything? Will you be over my life? I believe you're God. I, I, I believe you're the Savior. Will you pick me? The Bible says that at that moment, once you believe in your heart that you're saved, and as an act of declaration for us and a bold next step that I'm asked, like if that's you today, if that's you online, as a sign of boldness, I'm gonna count to three and I just want us to raise our hand and just this, this tangible next step of, man, I can't do this alone. This isn't just a personal relationship with Jesus. I need help doing it alone. One, two, three. Jesus, you're over everything. And that's the first step. And for every one of us else, I pray Jesus, you'll just give us this boldness to flip our city around 180 so we can look at our city and go, Jesus, you're over it. People are for you because Jesus, you are for them. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.